In this graph, we're looking at the oxygenation states of hemoglobin and the O2 dissociation curve. This is an experimentally generated curve that can help us understand what hemoglobin is doing with regard to binding or releasing oxygen under a variety of partial pressures of oxygen. And we see down here on the bottom in our x-axis, we have a partial pressure of oxygen. Our lungs generally have a partial pressure of oxygen of about 100, maybe 105 millimeters of mercury. And then our tissues, at least at rest, are down here around 40. Now, if we begin to exercise, our tissue PO2 can fall, especially at the skeletal muscles, of course. It might be down to about 20, right? But in general, our tissues are in this sort of 20 to 40 millimeters of mercury PO2 range. Now, hemoglobin, if we look at a single molecule of hemoglobin, right, hypothetically, we're going to look at one molecule being exposed to these varying partial pressures of oxygen. And what we find is that single hemoglobin can really only uh, exist in five different states of binding to oxygen. It can be 0% saturated, in other words, zero out of the four binding sites are bound to oxygen. It can bind one, which would be 25% saturated, two would be 50, three, 75, and of course, four would be completely saturated with uh, oxygen. Now, what we find is that the stepwise increase in percent saturation is not linear. That is due to what we call subunit cooperativity. The hemoglobin molecule has four subunits, and they cooperate, they work together. This is a form of allosteric modulation, where the binding of oxygen at one site affects the binding of oxygen at the other sites. And so once the first oxygen becomes bound, the other oxygens sort of jump on quickly. And we end up with a sigmoidal shaped curve in the blue line here, if we average many molecules together undergoing this change. It's smoothed out because they don't all undergo these transitions at the exact same partial pressures of oxygen. But we see the stepwise differences for one, right? And then it gets smoothed out and we get this sigmoid shaped curve. Well, this is adaptive because it's very steep in the region, the PO2 region of our tissues. And what this means is that our hemoglobin is very sensitive to the partial pressures of oxygen at the tissues. In other words, if the partial pressure of oxygen were to fall at rest, to something closer to as it uh, exists during exercise, a little bit more hypoxic, our percent saturation is going to fall dramatically, right? And we're not sliding down the curve. We're simply exposing that uh, hemoglobin to a lower partial pressure of oxygen than uh, partial pressure of oxygen than we would have otherwise. Okay, and the the reason this works is that uh, hemoglobin really only exists in two stable states an R state and a T state. And the R state is favored in, uh, with high binding at high partial pressures of oxygen, right? So the R state is on this side of the curve. This is the state, uh, or the relaxed state, when hemoglobin is very accepting of binding to oxygen, binds very readily. Once we start to lose our oxygens and we start to desaturate, we transition toward what's called a T or taut state. In the taut state, oxygens are more likely to unload, right? We're less likely to be bound to oxygen. Our percent saturation falls dramatically, giving us this steep portion of the curve. And that's very adaptive to unloading that we see at the tissues. So once again, it's important that we uh, realize that we're not sliding up and down a curve, but that our O2 di dissociation curve is simply helping us understand the state of saturation of hemoglobin under differing tissue or lung conditions.